rarely we see so many students on campus on a Friday evening, so I am quite overwhelmed and surprised. But I know why you are all here. So there's a good reason why you are here on a Friday evening, because we have Ajay and his team. Um, so let me first of all take this moment to extend my warm welcome and uh, deep appreciation to uh, Mr. Ajay Behel, uh, Ms. Priyamba Dachinoy, and Mr. Ayush Tandon of AZBN Partners. Ajay, as you can see, is the A of AZBN Partners. Um, it's, a, it's a very special moment because uh, we have seen that firm grow from size to size and to be one of India's leading law firms. And uh, as some of you know, many years ago, way back in 2010, we did host um, Zia Modi, who is one of the co-founders of that firm itself. But we have all known and I have admired Ajay Behel from distance. And it was so fortuitous that we recently met along the sidelines of the ABA conference. And we got to talk. And uh, I'm so grateful to him for accepting our invitation and to come with his two of his uh, distinguished colleagues to come and have this interactive session. Um, I want to say that uh, one of the larger purposes of his visit is also to bring home the point about the extraordinary transitions in the legal profession and how the historically evolved straight-jacketed formula of legal education or for that matter not appreciating other dimensions of legal education is affecting adversely the future of legal profession. I will leave it to him and his colleagues to talk about the synergy between the law and accounting professions. But all I can say is that traveling around the world, establishing organizational capacities and building collaborations for our institution, I have learned so much about the fact that interdisciplinarity is deeply woven in the culture of good institutions. We are here fortunate that we have 12 different schools while the law school is the largest and is the first school that we established, the 11 other schools encompassing different aspects of liberal arts, humanities, and social sciences are schools in which you can take courses and you can become part of it. I want to begin uh, by posing a very important challenge to Ajay and his team. So Ajay and uh, both uh, Priyambada and Ayush, I have traveled around the country for the last, say, 14 years, and I've given over 12,000 talks across um, India. I have traveled to every city, and I speak to high school students, and I talk about law and future of legal education and higher education. And when, even when I talk to students who are preparing for law, and I make an important distinction between the entrance examination that we accept, which is LSAT, and the entrance examination with most national law schools take, which is the CLAT. And whenever I would make the distinction between CLAT and LSAT, and most recently I gave a talk to some 600 students in Mumbai, and they were all preparing for both these exams. And I said, um, you know, the most important distinction between LSAT and CLAT is that LSAT does not have questions on general knowledge, and CLAT has it. And I got some hundred students excited and they were clapping at that announcement. Then I said that LSAT uh, does not have questions on legal aptitude uh, and CLAT has it. And another hundred clapped and you know, really was very excited about it. Then I said that LSAT does not have questions on mathematics. And I got a standing ovation. 600 students were jumping in joy um, saying that this is it. This is what they were waiting for. Now, I bring that to make a larger point that a large part of mathematics education in India has unfortunately created a huge sense of phobia and fear in the minds of our young people. A larger number of you, for example, essentially ran away from the study of every dimensions of mathematics, mathematics to be able to be in law. And so in many ways, even when students are studying BCom, LLB, and BBA, LLB, and other such uh, aspects, one of the things that you're all so conscious of is that, how do I navigate numbers? How do I deal with balance sheets? How do I deal with any form of quantitative aptitude that I, can, that I should you know, uh, become familiar with? And this is one of the most important and critical challenges that we're facing because at the other end of the spectrum, 
we have a situation where artificial intelligence, robotics, machine learning, and new technological developments are shaping the future of all professions. It is indeed true that increasingly, the role of lawyers, as we have all understood historically, is going to change and change dramatically. ChatGBT, as we all know, has begun to make already a serious impact and a time will come very soon that lawyers, if they are not already checking out the view of ChatGBT, you might end up committing a professional uh, irresponsible act because you have not given sound advice to your clients. That is the change that we are seeing in this context, in this world that we are going to inherit. It's equally important that we pay attention to numerous dimensions of building capacity of our students, and that includes a more interdisciplinary approach towards the study of law that is not just limited to humanities and social sciences. I want to end by saying that the last four days, I was at MIT, Harvard, and Yale, meeting 25 engineers, scientists, and people who have spent a good part of their life working in technology. And I got a universal advice from all of them that you ought to make coding as a compulsory subject for every student in your university, including all law students. And I began to ask that if that is the type of imagination that is evolving, and they gave very good reasons why that should be the case, then we need to reimagine the future of legal education. We need to empower our students, not only for them to be pursuing careers in corporate law, but also a wide range of careers within the field of law or even beyond. And that's why this approach towards understanding the synergy between law and accounting is important. I also want to mention that um, our own evolution as a university in its modest origins in 2009, with only 100 students and 10 faculty members and 20 administrative staff at one school to where we are today with over 10,000 students and 12 schools and over 1,000 faculty members and 2,000 admin staff, this has been possible because of the innovations that has happened in our own evolution. We have constantly tried to push the boundaries of knowledge and to be able to create opportunities for interdisciplinarity, something that simply did not happen in most of our institutions in India for a variety of reasons. The next step in that process of evolution is to look beyond the narrow dimensions of what the law is and what the legal profession is today. And that is where the answers lie in other educational imaginations. Part of it is accounting. It could include economics. It could include many other subjects and disciplines as well. So with those words, I want to extend a warm welcome to Ajay, Priyamada, and Ayush, and to also thank them for taking the precious time out of their busy and billable hours to be with us. I want to thank all our faculty members and of course our students in particular for making the right choice and not to get out of the campus to go home and do other things over the weekend, but to stay on a Friday evening and be part of the session. I can assure you that this will be an immensely beneficial event and initiative, but also potentially a transformative learning experience as you go through the next hour and a half or so. Thank you. Let me start by wow. You know, it takes a lot to make a lawyer speechless, but you've achieved it through the combination of the fantastic welcome we got when we got here, the amazing, amazing initiative that you are fortunate that your university has taken because of liberal people like those sitting on the dais, starting with Dr. Rajkumar, and the fact that so many of you have taken time this evening. I know Friday, and especially these days when we've got you know, conversations about work-life balance and when should we get it right, and I'm, I, 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 I'm always known for making controversial comments on those topics, but it's really nice to see people sitting, as some of you probably heard that before. Uh, so, great, thank you. And uh, the question that you know, Vian has to ask ourselves is why law and accounting? Of course, I'll give you good reasons for it, 
but no, neither of them are rocket science. That's one good start. Even though we are in the legal business, as I said the other day, Raj, we were at a small group and we were all introducing ourselves, 20 people. And I said, I'm so I said, we, we are in the business of, and I could see people expecting some very serious comment. So I said, we are in the business of making law sound like rocket science. But uh, that's what our business is, but neither accounting nor rocket science, law or rocket science. So they, they, they have a basis for working together. And of course, I'll share some advantages of that with you. But I'll give you a little sense of my own career. And I really sometimes wonder whether I'm the right piece person to be speaking to students like yourselves who have taken and made choices so early in your life. Because people like us who have meandered uh, sometimes find it embarrassing to talk about it because uh, 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 you know I don't know if it's the right in the, in, in the current context. But I started my career in school. I did biology because my father was a doctor and I thought that I'll uh, do medical uh, the, join the medical profession. I did quite well, so I could have got into a medical college, but by that time, my father had tried this experiment with my older brother. It worked very badly, so he decided, I don't want anybody to do medical, now do whatever else you want. So we looked around and said, okay, what do we do? So I had some friends of mine from school who were a year senior, and they said, we are doing BCom. So I said, BCom kar lete hain, and we were so stupid, I had applied to St. Stephen's for economics, I got a call for the interview, Raj, can you believe it? I didn't even go for the interview. I mean, we were so dumb those days, and now I find people are, you know, waiting in line, catching up, I haven't got my interview call. So that's how daft we were. Anyway, BCom ho gaya, then we said, okay, now what do we do next? Uh, so some of my friends had joined CA, some of them were seniors, so we said, okay, let's do chartered accountancy. So we finished chartered accountancy. And then for seven years, I practiced as an accountant, and then uh, in between, I was working with the Mr. N.K.P. Salve, Ari Salve's father, uh, and he said, you must do law as well. And, uh, so I did law evening college, nothing fancy like what all of you are doing in this wonderful campus, getting great education. So I'm currently, to be honest, the most underqualified lawyer in AZB because I studied using kunjis uh, when I was practicing as an accountant. And at one stage, I had to complete, we had that... Uh, uh, system where you could be postponing your exam. So I had to give 27 papers in a period of 12 months. And I said, that I'm never going to be a lawyer. Why am I going ahead and putting myself through this whole process? I'm practicing as an accountant, trying to make a living. Uh, but I somehow managed to complete my exams. And within six months, I actually surrendered my certificate of practice as a chartered accountant. I was the first CA in Northern India to surrender his certificate of practice. And it happened to be the year my boss was the, was the president of the institute. That was the most embarrassing part. Right? My boss from Team Thakur Vedanath, I was article, was the president. And he called me. And he says, couldn't you have chosen a better year? Because I'm getting calls from everybody to say, your protege is the first one who deserted the profession. But in any case, the one thing I have to say for the accounting profession, that I've never regretted for a single day the seven years I spent in the profession. I became immediately obviously six years or seven years junior to all my contemporaries, people who were in school and college with me who did law were obviously my, my seniors. But I never felt overwhelmed when I started looking at things as a lawyer because the whole curriculum, and I'm not here to sort of suggest that everybody should do chartered accountancy, the topic is accountancy, but I want to give you a little sense for it. That I, I, the, the discipline as, uh, you know, when you're working as an accountant uh, is, is, is very rigorous. And the sad part is that when I look back, compared to what you go through, and that is why I think it's so fantastic as an opportunity, when you are doing accountancy or chartered accountancy, there is no faculty. You work as an article clerk, you have to sit for your exams while you're studying, while you're sort of working as an article clerk, and you get, we used to get 60 rupees or whatever it was at that time. There is nobody to take guidance from. The syllabus is as wide as it can get. We used to have one uh, particular paper called Calculus. And I remember asking the, the teacher, you know, we had in the evening classes, there used to be some classes, we said, what should we do? He said, don't ask me. You know, you do as much as you want. If you don't get it, then people will say we didn't get it, and therefore just go ahead and do. So there's no guidance. And it was the most horrific, the first exam that I gave, which was the intermediate, was the most horrific experience because you go to, uh, you know, you go to, a, uh, it was done in Tal Katora in, uh, in a school, and you know nobody in that room. And you are told that 3% or 4% of people in this room are going to pass because that was the sort of passing percentage. So half the time you're watching who's writing faster than you. <laughs> so 
you know, it just gives you, and I actually lost six kilos during that period that I was giving my intermediate because you couldn't digest anything. It was so scary because we were going from a college where you knew everybody from a school to a college and suddenly this faceless place where you don't know anybody and you don't know their relative capabilities. But it just that, that, that discipline, uh, uh, you know, that you have to go through and you write a ballot, prepare a balance sheet, and I'll come to some of that uh, specifics. But uh, that still was worth it when I moved to the legal profession, that forensic ability to think through a balance sheet which must tally. And that's really where, you know, we started blending this, 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 this thing in the firm when we, when we sh sort of shifted uh, 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 to the legal profession and I tried to set up a, a, a corporate firm, which of course was when I remember going to my boss to ask, uh, uh, you know, that I want to be a corporate lawyer, I remember Mr. Salve saying, what is a corporate lawyer? Please join Soli Sarabji now. I'll call him and I said, nah, it doesn't work that way. You know, I want to do corporate law. So I reluctantly wrote a letter for me to get a job with two or three lawyers. All of them said, we don't have space. So I said, hello, we may as well start ourselves. But that's, you know, how this whole uh, thing evolved into AZABC, then AZB, et cetera, et cetera. Now, coming to the whole issue of why accounting. Uh, first of all, I think Raj raised a very important question. When I spoke to him about this subject, he said, you know, Ajay, everybody, most students, when I speak to them accounting, they say, oh, we are very scared because we don't like mathematics. Now, accounting has got nothing to do with mathematics. In fact, I'll share with you an experience. When we, we were, uh, the syllabus changed when I did my intermediate. It became what was called new syllabus, a new math. So they introduced a maths topic. When I looked at that paper, and this is literally three years after I left school, there was not one one question that I could understand, not one. So I promptly went to my school, to, to Dr. Thomas, our school teacher. And I said, sir, I need to take some classes from you. He said, oh, sure, sure. I showed him the paper. He says, what is this? This is not my, some, my subject. So I had actually two friends. One is an IIT uh, engineer who now runs uh, uh, the, the, these hotels. And he and an engineer who used to come and teach us uh, this particular stupid math, which I've never used again in my life. But I struggled through it, got 29 out of 50, uh, uh, lost, uh, you know, my first position uh, in, in, the, in, in the exam and got third because I lost uh, 20, 20, 29 marks uh, just because of my maths paper. And the guy was the first had, I think, 50 on 50. I had 29 on 50. The second guy had 20, had 47 on 50. And I was actually only three marks behind them. But... I've never used that again, so I don't even know why this stupid paper was introduced, maybe just to scare people that, you know, you need to know mathematics. But accountancy and mathematics are not connected. Accountancy is just about numbers, numbers which all of you know, it's total, mad, subtract, multiply, itna sab kar sakte ho. there's absolutely no problem there. So first of all, disabuse yourself of this notion that accounting has anything to do with maths. Then the question, why accounting? See, accounting, to my mind, is a discipline which will be useful to you for the rest of your life in anything you do. Because accounting is what? It's basically keeping track of what you have, what you make financially, where it goes, and how you track it, and how it does at the end of the day. If you look at the, uh, the, the you know, what, what, does a, what does a balance sheet tell you? Uh, it tells you basically where somebody has got its assets, where they've got their liabilities, which are loans, outstandings, etc. What their income is, what the sources of income are, where this income is coming from, what business they're in, and you know, and obviously, uh, there's a lot of expansion of that because of the reporting requirements that have uh, expanded over the year. But it basically is nothing but the guts of a business in so far as the strength of the business is concerned. Because whatever you may say today, markets reward sustained profitability. So, you know, corporate governance is great. All of this has to happen. You have to have, you know, ethical organization. You have to have corporate governance. But if you have co great corporate governance, but you have lousy accounting or lousy, lousy profits, nobody is going to reward you. So understanding financial requirements, profit, how the money that the business makes, where the money is spent, how it's collected is very important. And believe me, accounting has just three principles versus how much we do in, in law in terms of interpretation of statute. It has three principles. Debit, what comes in. Credit, what goes out. 
debit the receiver, credit the giver, and uh, debit the expenses and credit income. It's as much as that, I'm not kidding you. It's just, if these are the three basic principles of accounting based on which you can construct anything that you want. So it, it gives you that ability to look at, as I said, where funds come in, how they are deployed, how they are spent. Why is it helpful in the legal profession? As Raj said today, lawyers, especially corporate lawyers, are advising businesses. One of the most important facets for any business is the financial implication, a deal, a transaction, um, uh, litigation. Anywhere where you can use uh, this information that you have and it can add value is always going to be important. And what accounting does is that it gives you this little forensic approach because what we were trained was that there's something called a trial balance. A trial balance is nothing but it just records you know, the debits and credits. And the trial balance is then taken into a profit and loss account or into a balance sheet. A two rupee difference between the trial balance, you think that, you know, let's find a way to cover it up. You know, two rupee hai, to idhar ko ko entry dal lete. But you learn that a two rupee difference could actually, if you explore, reflect a, f a fraud of hundreds of crores. It's as much as that. So you get this whole focus that the two sides of the balance sheet must tally. And I remember when I shifted to the legal profession and we had a partner and we were filing our first case, September 1986. Uh, and he had drafted something and I said, but where is this ending? You know, this balance sheet is now one-sided, I can understand, but it has to ultimately lead to a conclusion. And he said, nobody reads this anyway. I said, but I want to read it. I want to see a logical path forward where it ends up with a conclusion because I'm used to telling balance sheets which actually require you to focus on making sure the left, right, and the right side are actually balanced. So it becomes, in a sense, that training that you get from a broader perspective, shown of the advantages which I'll show you, which I've, I'll give you some examples over the career, over my own career, how accounting has helped me in, 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 you know, in different uh, uh, areas. That basic approach is a very important discipline to imbibe. Secondly, it gives you a slightly forensic edge. You get used to sort of poking into things, looking at things, 3D, 3D, look here, look left, look right, look up, look down, to try and find especially when you're looking at commercial matters, to find uh, something which is not evident, something which may be hidden somewhere. So you get that, you know, that approach of searching for, for information. I'm not suggesting law doesn't make you inquisitive. Of course, this makes you inquisitive. It's slightly different. It's not about being inquisitive. It's being just focused on, uh, uh, when we say, kira. You just get into it. You, know, you just start unearth with the view that I must unearth something over here. So that particular aspect becomes very, very uh, a part of your whole system. And when you now apply it as a lawyer, that particular combination will certainly give you an edge, which uh, will separate you from somebody who's not willing to look at that number. And the advantages are immense. And uh, I'll, I'll give you, you know, various experiences that I've had uh, over the years. A uh, very early one, early, early one, we were representing the Sikkim government uh, in a lottery case. And the, the guy who was running the lottery, he had been complaining to the government that he had been losing money all the time. But they were, you know, there were some pretty dumb guys in the government who terminated, they could have terminated his contract for so many breaches, but instead of that, they did something stupid and terminated it without cause. So he sued them. Now he sued them, suddenly he came up with this huge number of loss of profits. So they came to me and I looked at it, I said, well, hang on a minute, this guy's been losing money all these years. So he should be thanking us for kicking him out because every year he tells us that I'm not being able to sell the lottery tickets. So anyway, we went into this arbitration, I went to Sikkim, and there was a chartered accountant there who had sworn an affidavit. And what he had done was that if they were entitled to print a thousand lottery tickets, but were selling only hundred, he computed his profits based on the thousand number, even though they had never sold anything more than hundred in the last five years. So, 
uh, I was asked to cross-examine him. The first thing when I was introduced, I was, they told him, Mr. Bell is a chartered accountant. The fellow started getting nervous because, you know, his thinking was, I'm a CA, I'm going to be cross-examined by these lawyers, nobody's going to look at these numbers, they'll ask me some lofty questions about law which I'll duck. So I, in those days, the balance sheets of Indian companies used to require a disclosure of installed capacity and utilized capacity. Every, every company used to have that requirement. So I had taken the balance sheet, I remember, of Hindustan Motors, who used to make ambassador cars. I don't know if any of you have seen an ambassador car, but it was, uh, uh, it was what we had at that time. So there was installed capacity and utilized capacity. So I showed him the balance sheet. I said that uh, you've seen the profit here. How have they computed the profit? He says by the actually utilized capacity. So I said if, you, if I asked you now to compute the profits, going forward of Hindustan Motors and going backwards. What will you have to use? So he looked at it. I said, have you seen how they've computed the profit? He said, yes, by the, uh, the utilized capacity. So I said, do you agree? Therefore, utilized capacity is the basis for profit. Yes, sir, I agree. So then I went to his calculations. So now tell me, you sold 100 tickets last year, 90 the year before, 80 the year last before that. How you suddenly got to 1,000? So basically, we, we, we completely destroyed his deposition, uh, his affidavit. That particular deposition saved the state government because the arbitrator still gave an award against the state government in a number which was going to bankrupt the Sikkim government. So ultimately, that went to the court, and there was a division. The two judges disagreed. It went to the third judge, who basically relied specifically on the deposition and came to the conclusion that shorn of everything, whether there's a breach or not, there is no real loss of profit because their expert has now not been able to show us how there was actually profits when the number of tickets which he has sold and continue to sell is not even going to re re recover the cost that they have. So something as simple as that, which you, when you look at from an accounting standpoint, it's not easy as a lawyer. I mean, it may sound very simple, but if you're not, it doesn't come to you naturally if you don't know how to read a balance sheet. Today, I'll give you other instances where we use, you know, just this desktop review. Today, balance sheets of companies, uh, if you take any listed company, the amount of information that has to be given is huge. Uh, you know, it'll have what business you're in, what brands you have, what sectors you're in, what your growth engines are. There are times when we have looked at, when we are doing a combination from a CCI perspective, just reading the balance sheets of the two targets the target and the, 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 uh, the acquirer, you can actually look at it and come to the conclusion how much overlap there is without even getting into the economic analysis and so on and so forth. And this happened so many cases where we've looked at it, especially in the F excuse me, FMCG area, and you say, this is what they do, this is what they do. There is really no overlap. So you can give a very quick overview to your client in terms of what it is that you're likely to have to deal with. Overlap is certainly not one of those issues. Then I'll give you another example. The, if, you, if you saw the uh, definition, if any of you have st studied the Competition Act, there used to be a definition, still there, definition of turnover. Now the definition of turnover that the CCI was adopting was that Whatever is shown on the right-hand side of the profit and loss account, you just add that up and that becomes your turnover. And this became important because you had A, de minimis uh, exemptions, B, the question was how, how, how dominant you are. Now, if you are in the business of making cars, but you sell a factory, the competitive element is not in the factory, the competitive element is in the car. But this is how these people understood it. We took it to the CCI and I took the accounting books and the accounting processes and I said, sir, this is what turnover is from an accounting standpoint, from a competitive standpoint. Turnover should reflect the turnover of the business you're in, not the turnover of the shares the business has or the turnover of the building that has been uh, sold in a particular year. And based on that, actually, the, if you see the FAQs, the FAQs have recognized the CCI that turnover should only include turnover of the products that the company deals in. So you get the opportunity to be also a thought leader where you can go out and actually understand how you can change mindsets in so far as this particular aspect is concerned. Third is de, de minimis itself. Because there, was, there used to be, and now they've changed a little bit, a target exemption based on de minimis. Now, people would not know how to calculate it. 
So if you're, if you, we, we saw cases where a, 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 you're looking at a target in the US, for example, which is being acquired. That has a subsidiary in India which is providing services. So that service in expenditure is actually, it's an expenditure for that entity, it's not an income. But the way it was done, people were totaling the turnover of the parent entity and totaling the turnover of the local entity. And again, we went to the CCI and we explained to them the accounting principles. And they again came up with an FAQ saying that is not how it should be computed. Intercompany transaction should be eliminated. So that's how you basically use the accounting experience, knowledge to be able to deal with these particular issues. I'll give you another example. We are dealing with a litigation, very, very complicated litigation, where a person who basically had bought goods and was to supply goods uh, did not supply them. So we took a view that basically you're not, you haven't fulfilled the basic obligation of supply, therefore you can't claim what you're claiming. So they switched the argument and said we were only a financer. We were never involved in the purchase and sale. We are only a financer and we are not concerned with purchase and sale. We picked up their financial statements and lo and behold, of course, in the financial statements, they have treated themselves as a trader because they bought goods and they sold goods. And we presented that to the arbitrator. Now, these will come naturally to you when you have got some exp accounting experience because you, you, will, you will say, hang on a minute, you know, this guy, how do I find out whether this fellow's statement of whether he or she is a financer how do I validate that statement? One is I can just keep making arguments. The other is to find actual evidence where they themselves have declared themselves in a particular way. So again, I'm just giving you examples to show sort of how many different ways you can actually use accounting to be able to supplement and value add the advice that you're providing. Now I'll give you a forensic element of it. So in this particular case, People were supposedly buying commodities, wheat, uh, rice, and dal. And this was a classic slam dunk case. One of our client's employees was mixed up with the other side. And they basically accepted that goods had been received. They accepted that monies were due. So in, in the traditional way of looking at it, this is uh, you, you have no way out because you've got an acknowledged debt. And if you go to NCLT, you should be wound up. When we started looking at it, and I, this case really took every part of my accounting skills to, uh, to, to, to bear to reach the, you know, where we have ended up today, I found that there was no specifications given for the rice or the, or the wheat or the dal. So a person is given you a purchase order that I want 100 watches, 10,000 rupees each. You in turn have to buy those 100 watches from somebody else. You don't know what the watch is. It could be an Apple watch, it could be a Vogus watch. So we were able to establish that how on earth have this, how does this become a valid contract? Apart from just the legality, uh, because under the contract act anyway, the contract is void for uncertainty, but even from a practical standpoint, how does somebody say that I gave an order for something which is incapable of being bought or sold because you don't know what specifications there are. I mean, rice at the minimum, basmati, non-basmati is a basic issue. So again, they, they, we had even got actually a forensic done and the forensic chaps didn't pick this point up. But because of the sort of, you know, searching approach and Ayush worked briefly on that with me, we kept looking for where, what, where we could find something and this came across. So this wasn't specific to accounting, but it was a, 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 an aspect of the very sort of forensic type of approach that you take to a particular matter. Ayush and Prem Vada will share with you also uh, their own experiences, but what's happening today in the financial world is that when you're looking, let's say even it as an instrument, you have all read the Companies Act, you read preference share, equity shares, now you'll see that these are all taken as capital when you look at the Companies Act. We have now a new animal called Indian Accounting Standards. Their preference shares is treated as debt. Now suddenly that whole paradigm that you think as a lawyer is totally different when you look for a balance sheet of a company, you won't find the preference share under share capital. Now if you don't know what has changed, you will find yourself a bit lost that, you know, I, I know that preference capital is capital, but where on earth has it disappeared in the financial statements of the company? And similarly, I've seen so many transactions where lawyers have come up with very fancy structures 
in terms of truing up the investment, the anti-dilution, taking more shares, but the accounting treatment that they have given at the time the investment was made completely trumps all those options. Those options are all unworkable. So you've got a very fancy document which provides that you can do many things, but actually if you translate that document or you take it to the financial statements, you will find that it is not possible to deliver what you have agreed to, what you promised your client, and all you can hope for is that that situation never actually occurs because somebody is going to ask the question, that's great, now deliver to me, since this particular default has happened, I need the incremental shares. And at that point, you're going to be looking at the agreement and looking at the financial statement and saying, sorry, they can't be delivered. So until and unless these, these, these basic features are imbibed, I think as you go through your journey as, 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 as lawyers, uh, whether you go for corporate or you go for litigation, anything that you will look at, there is some possibility, I mean, it's not going to happen in every case, but there is some distinct possibility of using this accounting information and knowledge that you have to be able to value add what you are actually doing. So, uh, you have all the facilities. An accountant, as I said to you, has none of these facilities. Their learning comes from basically nobody, from nothing. You have the facility of this fantastic campus. You have the facility of fantastic uh, faculty. Uh, I'm hoping that the same enthusiasm that lawyers develop for accounting, we can imbibe with the accounting profession. And I really, my, my, my mission is actually to have many more chartered accountants be willing to train themselves as people who can teach. Because the other problem that you're going to face, Raj, is that you're going to, finding faculty is not easy because accountants, you know, get uh, jobs. Uh, most of them are working somewhere. And you, uh, it, it, that the kind of development that has happened in your profession, that hasn't happened in the accounting profession. So the need for faculty, the demand for faculty, hasn't actually been created. And that demand can be definitely met to my mind if more and more chartered accountants are willing to start becoming faculty and start teaching people uh, this particular very not so complicated subject, which uh, I think is, is, is you know, something that you can always uh, pick up as you go along. Uh, I don't know what, how you would plan this, Raj, but you've got you know, five years, as I said to him when I was speaking to him. Five years, I'm talking about the five-year course, for example, Five years residential course, I honestly think that you should come out in that five years as at least 50 percentage as chartered accountant or 50 percent of the knowledge that a chartered accountant can have because you have the time. You have focused attention being given to you by faculty and that doesn't happen to a chartered accountant. So there are some phenomenal advantages that you have which the accounting profession doesn't have which if you are enthusiastic about it and you are willing to participate. I'm sure that the, the, the sort of uh, faculty that you have and the f forward looking uh, approach that I've seen and how quickly Raj embraced this idea when I spoke to him. I should tell you that one other university had approached us. I had met them in, a, in a, the vice chancellor of the Gujarat Law College in a, a committee I was on. And we've run some classes for them. I did one, I used did a few, and they have become the, uh, very well received. She's been after me to run more and more classes there. Uh, but you know, time is an uh, uh, issue, so we've not been able to uh, carry them on. Take, for example, uh, insolvency. How much time have I got? Five minutes? Uh, I'll just finish, so I'll uh, take insolvency, for example. Very big area, all of you read about it, insolvency. Insolvency is all about insolvency plans, there's a legal part to it, but ultimately it's all about a plan to revive an organization. Lawyers are currently playing a huge role there. A lawyer who understands that accounting can truly look at the, the revival plan, look at working closely with the resolution professional, keep, look at uh, the COC because you have the advantage that you're reviewing the agreements, you're looking at the loan documents, you're looking at uh, you know all the other aspects of the organization. Just think of how much power you can get to yourself if you can also work on the actual resolution plan. Phenomenal. Valuations. I mean, I remember that we used to have sit in a meeting 
uh, you know, when people are talking about valuing a brand and uh, somebody's talking about discounted flash flow, and you'd see people around there, you know, who don't have this concept of what the DCF is, is looking at each other and feeling out of, out of place. And we ran some classes at the firm. Uh, my son-in-law, who's himself an uh, MBA, uh, he came and ran a few classes, and my daughter did, and we prepared a valuation for dummies. And 10 of our clients actually asked me that we'd like to take this lawyers who were going you know, for meetings, and they said, for the first time, I can actually sit in a meeting where my financial colleagues are talking about DCF and cost of capital and uh, 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 perpetuity value and all that, and I can actually sit there and sound a little intelligent. That's also important. At the end of the day, you may not necessarily have to be, be the driver or the contributor, but you should have that ability to at least feel that you can participate in an intelligent discussion and not be overwhelmed. Combine it with the liberal thinking that you have. On the flip side, uh, when I shifted to the account, from the accounting profession, I realized how much more there was to learn. Because the accounting profession, one of the biggest problems, because of the limitations we have in terms of faculty, communication, you don't really get, you get tunnel visioned. And you start believing that what you know is all, all there is to learn. And I, I realized that the legal profession has tons to offer. In fact, it used to bug me when I was practicing tax that we'd go to a, a lawyer who doesn't know anything about tax and who would just look at the act and come up with an interpretation or a possible option which I had never thought of. And it actually used to bug me. But I realized that that is part of the profession that we have, where we have this liberal thinking. We look at things from afresh, which are sometimes without a biased mind. Combine that with the skill that you bring as an accountant. So you have the combination of that discipline combined with the combination of that free thinking. And you can produce, to my mind, a lethal and spectacular combination. So with that, uh, and you'll hear some stories from Prem Vada, who's a lawyer, lawyer, not even an accountant, and then you'll hear them from Ayush. And I hope that you will feel encouraged to believe that this is a subject that you must take on, you must imbibe. Reminding you again, it's not rocket science. It is not that complicated. No mathematics. I'm sure you can all total. I'm sure you can all minus, divide. It's all that is there is, there is to it, and the rest is all about you know, just understanding the, the various elements of how to prepare a balance sheet, which can show you so much about an organization. Uh, in diligences, which Prem Vada will talk about. In fact, we designed our diligence based on telling people how to reach a balance sheet. Because you, if you read a balance sheet, you'll see contingent liabilities, liabilities, you'll get a sense of the organization. Uh, if you're working as an executive assistant with an organization, uh, you know, from a, from a legal standpoint, I'm talking about somebody working with the CFO, CEO, and you're looking at another organization, just imagine if, you, if he tells you that, you know, just take a look at this organization and give me a little report on this. Just think about what more you can add beyond just saying from a legal standpoint, they're in the telecom business, they're governed by licensing regime, they're governed by this, they're governed by that. Just think what value you could add if you could read their financial statements and say, They've got some problems, they've got to pay uh, some dues, they've got financial liabilities, this is a problem, that is a problem, this is the good thing, this is the bad thing. It just suddenly raises the level of what you do. So I know it's a hard sell, uh, but truly I do believe there's great value if you can combine this synergy. And uh, I hope that uh, by the end of this conversation, uh, you will feel that way. Obviously at the end, if they have questions, I'd be delighted to answer them. Thank you. First of all, thanks a lot. Uh, thank you uh, for having us over. And uh, thank you for turning out in such good numbers. And I can tell you, um, I was one of those people who took up law simply and simply to avoid math, accounting, numbers, number crunching. And uh, for whatever reasons, I think there is no running away. Uh, but I'll start with a little bit of a background about myself. Uh, I'm Priyamvada. I am a senior partner with AZB, and I've been with the firm for nearly 13 years and otherwise 15 years in the profession. So somebody who hated maths, did not want to do numbers, and if I have survived it for 15 years, I'm sure definitely all of you can. And it's just not about numbers like the way Mr. Bell explained. I think it's, much, it's, it's very interesting once you start working, once you get involved in transactions, 
So I do a lot of M&A, private equity transactions, debt, lending transactions. And you'll see that at every stage, there is an interplay with accounting, with tax. And there, you will always have an edge over others if you are able to read the balance sheet, you're able to show something just more beyond just the legal points. And like the way Mr. Bell explained that if there are just these few points that you could pick up and highlight to your client, that brings in a lot of value. So while I'll try to simplify, and I'm going to get into a little bit of specifics in terms of how there is an interplay in M&A as well as private equity transactions or lending transactions, and at how at each stage of a, you know, an overall uh, private equity or an M&A transaction, we see that interplay between accounting and tax. Um, so getting into the specifics, typically for any M&A or a private equity transaction, one of the initial stages or the initial steps is a legal due diligence. So a lot of you may have done internships at law firms or you know firms and you know, you would have heard the term legal due diligence. You must have also wondered what is this data punching that you know uh, associates or you know the team is sitting and doing but it's a very critical aspect of a transaction because that's where you identify and highlight to your client that these are the liabilities these are some of the issues whether it's regulatory it's it could be accounting or it's um, you know some non compliances issues and that's the whole purpose for which a legal due diligence is done now as a thumb rule and one of the first things that we do or even i do is that we open the financial statements of the company. Now that helps us to understand, it just gives you an overall picture and insight about the company, the health of the company, risks, liabilities, what are the issues. The way these financials, you know, then like Mr. Bell pointed out, that a lot of the, the financial statements have so much details given in it. So some of the things, like I could give you some examples now, um, when you look at the financial statements of a company, it'll give you an insight on the share capital, whether there are preference shares, equity shares, what are the rights given, what are the investors, who are the investors in the company. Secondly, loans, debts of the company, which is again a very critical aspect of a legal due diligence or something that the client would want to know. Now again, when it comes to debt, whether it's by way of some instruments or it's a term loan, what is the interest rate? How is the security? What are the rights that the lender has? You'll get a brief synopsis of that in the financial statements. Another aspect is guarantees. Now, there's a, you know, guarantees again, the way it works is that when a guarantor is giving a guarantee, he's not liable at that point, but there is a liability in case of a default by the borrower. Now, where you have companies where there are, you know, it's a large group, there are group companies, sister concerns, it's very common for companies to give guarantees in these situations. So when you read the financials, you will see there'll be notes in the accounts highlighting the fact that there are guarantees that have been given, which again, when you highlight to your client, it can help them assess that yes, even this liability, though it's not today, but this liability does exist. Similarly, related party transactions, it's another very critical aspect in an M&A or a private equity transaction because say if it's 100% acquisition, you would want or your client would want that these related party transactions are cleaned off. Now until you, while the company can, maybe they will highlight this to you, but how do you match it? All these aspects are recorded in the financial statements. So if you read the books of accounts, you read the financials, you'll get the details, you can point it out to the client, and then also suggest solutions as to how these have to be addressed going forward. And there are similar concerns when in a private equity transaction as well. Similarly, if you read the financials, you'll always get a sense of what are the other liabilities. So if there are claims against the companies, there are litigations against the companies, you'll see notes highlighting the fact. And from there, you can pick up the leads, you will get the cue and how to ask for information from the company, and then you know dwell more upon it or get more details. Similarly, even from a labor law perspective, you will have to keep going back to the financials because in some cases or certain legislations, uh, for example, gratuity, you will have to look at the provisioning created in the books of accounts. In gratuity, even as per the statute, you're supposed to create a provision in certain states to cover for the gratuity liability. So even from a diligence, right from the beginning, at some point or the other, you need to keep going back to the financials to look at these aspects, highlight it, and also, you know, when you highlight these things, you can also, it shows to the client that you're not just sticking to some of these legal aspects, but you're just you're going a little beyond that as well. Again, I think the point is not that we all have to be experts, but I think 
just to be aware, to have that knowledge, to get a sense, to get an understanding, and to just have that edge over others to, you know, to at least have something beyond simply highlighting some of the legal points. Now coming to some of the other stages of a transaction, which is, you know, drafting of the transaction documents, or from a regulatory, you know, any approvals that are required, any consents that are required from, say, the Competition Commission or the RBI. Again, at, you know, we have seen even in those stages as well, there is always an interplay where you need to go back to accounting standards, to tax, to financials. So I'll take a few examples there. Uh, Mr. Bell did touch upon the aspect of uh, preference shares. So I'll just elaborate on that. Now, when you in a typical private equity transaction, um, investors, uh, when they invest, there's also an expectation that at the end of their investment horizon, there's an exit to be given to the investor, which means that the investor needs to get his money back or a return on that money. Now, there are concepts, uh, you know, in terms of how exit is given. It could be by way of a IPO or a strategic sale, a cap reduction, or a buyback. Now, there are issues, so when in case of shares, where there is a right given to the investor, that at some point these shares have to be bought back at a, a agreed price or a fair market value. While from a Companies Act perspective, it's a share capital. We always look at shares or preference shares as share capital. But from an accounting standpoint, the treatment gets, there's a different treatment given where it can be treated as a debt. Now this has huge ramifications from a, regulatory standpoint because where there are companies like NBFCs involved, uh, it can affect their debt equity ratio, the leverage limits that they have. So there are some of these issues then, you know, which we need to be mindful of even when then we are drafting the documents or how these rights have to be structured. Similarly, from a competition law perspective, which Mr. Bell addressed that when you go for a, uh, you know, there are certain thresholds uh, if the transaction in terms of turnover or the asset size, are you know are breaching certain thresholds you need to notify the competition commission which means that it is subject to their approval now again how are these how do you determine the financial thresholds by way of turnover asset size where again you need to go back to the financials you need to have that understanding of how to determine calculate and to be able to advise on these aspects so these are just some of the examples even from a debt uh, transaction point of view, how you draft your interest clause, for example. That will help in determining that how is it to be even reflected in the financials of the company. So again, I'm not, I don't want to belabor on this point more, but these are just some of the examples, some of, uh, you know, uh, the instances. And there are many more, whether it is from a transaction point of view or from an advisory mandate where you'll always, there'll be occasions where you need to keep going back to accounting, to financial statements, to keep getting a sense of how the company is recording its books. And again, you know, just repeating, for somebody who used to, who did not want to look at numbers, but you know, it is, it's a very interesting f um, aspect, and it really brings in a lot of value, uh, you know, once you start working. So with this, uh, uh, you know, uh, I'm gonna request Ayush then maybe to come over. I am Ayush Tandon, and uh, so similar to Mr. Behel's experience of how he started his education, I am a chartered accountant, then I did my CFA, and then I did my law. Uh, and that's how I moved into uh, the law firm, and, and with great guidance of Mr. Behel, uh, I'm still in, in, in the legal field itself. <laughs> so I want to start with reiterating the larger objective of what we are discussing. I think the the, the larger question is what is financial knowledge or accounting knowledge in the context of you as law students? The way I would put it is, it is your ability to understand the financial implications of whatever matters that you are working on as a lawyer. So once you graduate, you will be working on various matters, whatever are the financial or accounting implications of that, to that extent, uh, we would limit our discussion that uh, that is the relevant uh, topic for, as being the financial knowledge. Now, over the years, uh, increasingly we have seen that legislations have imbibed financial concepts, financial jargons in the law, in the rules, in the regulations itself. So 
it automatically becomes imperative for you to be advisors to clients as as lawyers to to have knowledge of at least the basics of accounting and finance to appreciate those and to advise on those i'll give you a few examples so some of you when you graduate and 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 become lawyers you would want to become for example tax lawyers now tax is a field where it's almost impossible for you to practice as a lawyer without having knowledge of accounting and finance and without knowing how to read a balance sheet for example under the income tax act one of the sections says that if when a purchaser purchases shares of a company from any third person then at the time of purchase if that purchaser is paying more than the book value of shares then he is subject to tax at the purchase stage itself so if i am purchasing if i am paying 100 rupees to acquire shares and the book value of the those shares that i am acquiring is 150 rupees then i have to pay tax on 50 rupees at the time of purchase itself now what will a client do a client will simply come to you and and give you the facts and say that these this is the company and i am purchasing shares for 100 rupees it is for you as lawyers to now dig into the fact that what is the book value now unless you know how to read a balance sheet you will not be able to figure out the book value and advise the client in a holistic manner there are numerous such examples in tax laws whether it's income tax act or the gst law where you will have to turn to the financial statements now and then to give a holistic advice another example some points that mr behel also touched upon is is the litigation field some of you may want to get into litigation once you graduate and and become lawyers now while strategizing a litigation at the planning stage itself when you get to know about the matter for example there is a disputed transaction the first thing that as a lawyer you know you would want to see is what are the admitted facts by then and as for us at azb what we do is we pick up the financial statements of our client and of the counterparty to see how have they been accounted for because once the management has accounted for a transaction and presented it in one way it is an admitted fact so so there are a lot of leads that can be uh, obtained even in terms of uh, at at the planning stage itself i'll give you one example a live example that happened uh, we were acting for an investor who had invested large sums of money in a multi brand retail company one of the largest re multi brand retail companies in india after a couple of years that multi brand retail company went belly up and they said that you know we are we are at a loss of liquidity and we don't have money because we have lost money in business losses so those are business losses now we don't have money either you fund us or we are going to breach the agreement because we are constrained to do so what we did is we picked up the financial statements to really see what happened and at a cursory look what we could figure out is that there was some monies that came into the company and in the same financial year in the related party schedule which is a specific schedule in the financial statements we could see that the money has been on lent to some other entities which are related companies of the promoter so we could then pick on this point and then move forward with the confrontation in that manner now all of these things can only happen if you have some basic knowledge of the financial statements and we are not here to say that you know you can uh, you, you should become financial experts but at least if you can pick up these points at an early stage and then financial experts or forensics can come in to dig deeper into the into the matter another example is is a large part of litigation revolves around insolvency bankruptcy court and the resolution plans that are going on now all of these legal matters are going on in either national company law tribunal or the entlat what if you if you look at the larger picture what are these resolution plans and and insolvency and bankruptcy courts these are basically financial packages that are being discussed and adjudicated upon in the court rooms so so you know i i would just go ahead and take a, to say that now there is no running back from the fact or hiding from the fact that that you have to have some basic level of financial knowledge to be able to practice these areas 
Another example is that, for example, in a litigation, you are wanting to file a, a recovery suit against a counterparty. One of the basic checks that we do in, in this such, such sort of a litigation is to check whether the counterparty has the wherewithal to even pay you that money once you get the final judgment. And thankfully, we are in a country where financial statements of every company is, is sort of a matter of public record. You can get it from the Ministry of Corporate Affairs uh, website. So if, that, if the counterparty doesn't have the wherewithal to eventually pay that amount to you, why would you want to litigate for years and, and just get a judgment? So then you can plan your strategy accordingly to maybe rope in the directors or shareholders or depending on the facts of the matter. You know, just to sum up, if you look at the industry that you are in, once you become lawyers, I think the most important facet of, the, of this industry would be your clients. And today, increasingly, we are seeing that the clients are looking for holistic solutions rather than just technical knowledge. So that according to me, that holistic solution can only happen if you have a 360 degree view of the matter, which includes viewing the financial implications of, of the matter that you're advising on. Another uh, you know, facet of this industry are the firms. As for our firm, we can say that we are increasingly devoting more and more time uh, towards educating all our associates in the firm to have knowledge of accounting and finance. And which is why this, this initiative is so close to Mr. Behel, because what we believe is that if we have to do so much in the firm, why can't it start at the college stage itself? So, so at least in our firm, at least uh, almost twice a year, I am conducting sessions on accounting and finance for all our associates. As for colleges also, if you see internationally, now Harvard Law School had conducted a study of, of its attorneys who had graduated from their law school and they asked the question, what is that one skill that should be added into their course? And the answer of majority of them was basics of accounting and finance, which eventually happened. And now in Harvard Law School, in their curriculum, there is one semester in which a, in which a particular subject by the name of basics of accounting and finance. One last point that I want to leave you with is unrelated to your profession. So ultimately, you know, when you start working and you, you start earning, you will be, you, you'll start earning money. And, and when do you start saving or investing? According to me, it's, it's the day you start earning. And if you have a good basic knowledge of accounting and finance, you will be able to appreciate the different asset classes. You will be able to ask the right questions and at least head in a direction that will make you prudent financial decisions even in your personal life. I think that's all that I wanted to say and thank you so much for the opportunity. Look forward to speaking with all of you.